to The Loins of History. My name is Jay, and I'm joined by my co-host, Colin. Uh, This is a podcast that desires to connect history to current events, as well as correct historical and political illiteracy. And we are very excited this week because we are starting our new series on the fall of empires. Uh, The reason why we chose this theme, the fall of empires, is because here in the United States, but uh, also just the West writ large, kind of feels like it's in this period of decline. And thinking about uh, the rest of the world, thinking about what's going on here, you know, we, you see the news, you see economy's not doing so hot, society, culturally speaking, isn't doing so hot. There's all this conflict, strife, um, there's a lot of negativity going on. And we just kind of wanted to do a series on looking at the history Because our mission here at the Lens of History is to apply history to what's going on today. And we actually believe that the study of history in all of its different facets actually has something to say about what's going on in the world today. So with that, I'm very excited to turn it over to Colin, who's going to get us started on our first empire, the Empire of Rome. Colin, what you got for us? Thanks, Jay. Yeah, this is, um, you know, we also try to capitalize on the, the, uh, the TikTok thing, thing of, uh, how many times a day does your man think about the Roman empire? That's right. Get, we're guilty there. And the answer to that for us is every day. Well, Uh, actually, or multiple times a day. I don't think about Rome every single day. When I saw that trend, I probably think about Rome every other week. Hmm. See, Max, I think there's two different ways you can think about it. There's like the explicit, like, huh, why did Honorius abandon the Britannia? Or there's the kind of implicit, like, Oh, the Romans built really good roads or something like that, where you just, Mm. you just kind of pat a passing thought. So that's kind of what I qualify it as like, boy, our our roads are really terrible here. Rome's are the road. The roads that the Romans built are still here, and ours are falling apart ten years after they're built. So that's right. You know, some you know, of- I, that's fair. I was thinking like about dwelling on the Empire of Rome, but you're right. There's so much implicit stuff uh, that we we get from the Roman Empire. It's really hard to. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can't go throughout your day without encountering something that we received from the Romans. Right. It. And, you know, within, I think, Western and really culture worldwide right now, there is an obsession with, like, the end, like, fall of empires, the end, Mm -hmm. Armageddon, these great epic battles. And, you know, you see it in pop culture. Like, there's the, uh, remember that movie, I Am Legend? There's um, Armageddon, all sorts of movies like that. People are are pretty much obsessed with it. And it's, it's like this... I mean, right now with everything going on in the Middle East, I mean, the the dispensationalist got Kirk Cameron on speed dial right now. So, <laughs> what is it? Uh, all the left behind left folks behind. are like <laughs> left we're behind. Like, we're waiting. The Antichrist is standing where he should not stand. We're we're right there, but but that we kind of want a specific. <laughs> we digress. Want, we digress. We specifically <laughs> want to dispel. The idea that empires fall in some cataclysmic event, mm. they don't. Almost, almost without exception, and there's there's a few exceptions. Empires fall over long periods of times over right. multiple different causes. It's not just one epic battle. It's not just some great um, ecological disaster. It is right. all of those things over time, constantly working. Tiny, tiny little muscle movements that culminate into these large events like Rome, for instance, looking at the Roman decline, there's it's debatable when you want to say Rome started its decline, but I personally look at it from uh, when Marcus Aurelius died and Commodus uh, became sole emperor. Um, Mm. What, what just to cage my brain here, what year was that ish? 
Marcus Aurelius died in 180. So from mm-hmm. 180 AD to 476 AD, which is when the Western Roman Empire collapsed, that's almost 300 years. That is longer than the United States has existed as a country yeah. by a couple decades. So that's to put it in perspective. Their empire declined over that period of time. And during that time, there was a lot of great emperors and actually growth during that. So mm-hmm. like Diocletian, Constantine, Aurelian, there's a lot of great yeah. emperors and there was a lot of great um victories even 20 years before mm. their fall they defeated the huns um with edius mm. at the battle of the catalonian plains in france they defeated them 20 years before they collapsed so mm. the greatness of rome still existed in the decline and within that decline there's just so many different things that were happening we want to focus on a few of them and then tie them all together um, and then, you know, listeners now can look back and say, hey, I kind of recognize some of those things happening today. So not going to be exactly the same, but you can recognize some of these. And over the next three episodes, when we talk about the fall of Rome, we're going to specifically for this episode, talk on the economy. And the next episodes, we'll talk on the military corruption and um, the cultural decline of Rome. But for this one, I want to sp- focus on the economy because I think it's often really overlooked as one of the key causes um, at least amongst the average historian or just amateur that likes to look on the history of Rome. And I think there's a lot of things that happen um, that set up um, some of the military failures that they had in the cultural decline as well. So yeah. with that being said, I'm going to kick it off with the economic decline. Yeah, real quick. I'm super glad, Colin, that you chose to to start us off on the economic side because – The economy is so foundational to all other facets of like the health of a society. Mm -hmm. If, if you're like, you're not going to have a strong military without a strong economy. When the economy is going bad, that seems to be fertile ground for there to be like cultural and ethnic uh, issues so I'm I'm glad you started with the economy. So excited yeah. to see what you Remember, it's the economy, stupid, as Carvel said. Um, mm, that's right. So, <laughs> <laughs> little American history thrown in there. So I'll, I'll start off with a quote by uh, Arnold Toynbee. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Mm. Um, in his work, uh, A Study of History, the gradual yeah. disuse of the currency and of the exaction of dues in kind as the barbarian incursions grew more and more serious had made the system of the fiscal administration more and more oppressive. The oppression of the fiscal administration seems to have been one of the causes of economic decline. I'm going to get to that in a second, but I did want to point out that there's a lot of lit- – he, he sees the barbarian invasion – and then he ties it to the economy with like what you're saying, Jay, that it exacerbated those problems because they could, they had a bad economy. They couldn't support it. So let's give a quick overview of the Roman economy, you know, circa um, 50 AD to the collapse or, you know, really to this decline in 180 AD. So Rome stretched from Britannia all the way to uh, Mesopotamia and the Gulf uh the the Persian Gulf in Saudi Arabia covered everything in between. The entire Mediterranean was known as our lake, the Roman lake. Hmm. By about um, 150 AD, they had about 100 million people, which is massive for that time. And I think within the city of Rome, it was over a million people, which for an ancient city is massive. If you think yeah, about crazy. the amount of infrastructure that would have been required to, to do that and the amount of money it would take to support that. So... Looking at that economy under a little bit more of a microscope, they were able to support a massive population because within this economy, they had incredible supply routes internal to the empire so or trade routes, excuse me. So you could have grain shipped across the Mediterranean to the Italian peninsula and make it as far away as Spain, where in Spain they can mine silver and send the silver all the way over to Cappadocia and Cappadocia could spend, send gold all the way to Britannia and Britannia could export tin and pottery and things like that. So it created a, a kind of a ancient supply chain that was wildly effective and it kept 
people in specialized forms of labor. So you could have mm-hmm. artisans, you could have craftsmen, you could have engineers, you could have all of these things that were built like the aqueducts and the roads. You could fund those projects because your economy was thriving. You had people specialized. People weren't having to um, build a farm, farm it, take care of animals, go fight wars. They weren't doing all these things. They were specializing. And yeah. that really did a lot for them. So it caused them to grow. And then if you look outside of the empire, the Roman economy was kind of like the the center of the world, really, because they found um, Roman coins as far off as China uh, via the Silk Road and then all throughout the Silk Road. And there wasn't really direct trade between China and Rome. There was It passed through middlemen, obviously, in Central Asia and the Middle East. But there were coins all over India that through seafaring trade that they did have direct trade routes with. So you can see that trade both internal to the empire and externally into the empire was a huge source of wealth. And within that wealth, they were able to levy um, kind of a small tax. I think it was between five to ten percent of tax, you know, they, of a tax levy. So nothing too burdensome, but still enough that emperors could fund armies. So all of the legions, you think, you know, they require food, they require pay, they require equipment. You think Rome cities that are being built by the Romans need roads. They need wall. Well, they needed walls later. We'll get to that. Um, they needed aqueducts. <laughs> they needed all of these things to function and survive for a while. The Roman empire before the decline was able to fund all of this. So mm. let's get into where it all started going wrong for them. Just for anybody listening, uh, Jay and I are enjoying uh, a tasteful alcoholic beverage. I'm being <laughs> when in Rome. I am taking some red wine while Jay slip, Jay sips on some uh, rice uh, rice whiskey. Yeah, some some Japanese whiskey from the most perfect island of Okinawa, Japan. Very nice. So I want to start off before the decline. And this kind of gets into the expenditures and why expenditures became so high to a point that the government, in order to maintain this payroll that it had created in this bureaucracy, it had to continue to raise taxes to unsustainable levels. So starting with right around Nero and some of these other bad emperors prior to Commodus, I'm sure everybody has heard the give them bread and circuses and they'll never revolt. Well, that's really true. And you think about it, the Ro- the city of Rome had a massive dependency on this free bread and spending and the problem with that, see, done in moderation or done for festivals, it's really not a bad thing. It really wouldn't even put a dent in the, the coffers. But once you start to do that and bad emperors have to continue to do this, you can never really go back. So if you think about with Nero, in his time frame, there was always seemed to be a recurring trend around Roman emperors where you'd have a bad emperor, but then you'd have a couple good ones that would sort of offset Mm. everything that the bad emperor did. But once we start getting to Commodus and after Commodus, it became bad emperor after bad emperor after bad emperor. And the problem with that is if you're going to buy the local population off, which they would use as a weapon to counteract the influence of the Senate, You can never get them off the payroll, meaning Mm. you can't just stop these welfare projects. You can't just stop paying people in bread and giving them games and circuses. You have to continue this. And if somebody comes along and says, hey, so-and-so, such-and-such emperor doesn't want to do this, I do, the people will revolt and put that Mm. emperor in place. And Rome was a dangerous political uh, city for centuries, um, but definitely during like the crisis of the third century and on afterward to the point that they actually eventually Roman emperors actually stopped ruling from Rome and they ended up moving the capital to Ravenna later. Totally different story. But so that's one part of government expenditures where you have the people of Rome kind of on the payroll, so to speak, and you can't take them back. You can walk it back a little bit, but only so much, especially if you're a bad emperor and you're doing terrible things like Commodus. The second is the Praetorian Guard. Mm. If you are a Roman emperor and there is utter turmoil and you 
maybe came to power through unscrupulous, unscrupulous means, chances are you have quite a few enemies who want the throne. Mm. And Rome is very well known for its insane levels of corruption, insane levels of corruption up and down. It's like a pit of vipers. The Praetorian Guard is not, maybe initially when it was formed was very honorable, but toward the latter part of the imperial era in late stage Rome, it was just a cesspit of corruption. Mm. Here's an example. Commodus was executed by, I believe it was his wrestling partner, infer what you will from that, um, who strangled him um, one day. What are infer, we supposed to infer? What are we supposed to infer from that? Inf- infer from what you will, because I think he, he strangled him in the showers. So uh, infer ah, what you will. Indeed. Infer what you will. Anyway, he was assassinated. His successor was some by the name of Pertinax. So Pertinax was a short rule, or excuse me, not a sh- he wasn't physically short, but he ruled for a short period of time. And he was kind of a no-nonsense emperor. And the idea that the Senate had was, we're going to put somebody who's so unlike Commodus, he can walk back some of these problems that Commodus had created. I mean, Commodus was so bad, he was like executing uh, senators. He was like sleeping with their wives in front of them. It was total degradation of the Rome of what the Roman Republic used to be. And these, these former high ranking officials, Mm. they wanted that to stop. So Pertinax takes over and he's a no nonsense type of guy. Um, And so he starts looking and seeing that, man, we are spending a lot of money to buy off the Praetorian guard. And he's like, no, Mm. that ends today. Well, he ends up. Long story short, he ends up getting assassinated by yeah. by the Praetorian Guard. Just just like the bread and games. Once you start, it's really hard to stop. You can't do it. So the best part of this is the Praetorian Guard says, "Hmm, now we've got to go find a new boss." So they just walk outside and start announcing that the Roman, the throne for the Roman Empire, is up for bid, and they make this announcement. And a man by the name of Didia Didianus Julianus. Didius Julianus, excuse me, says, I want to buy the purple, meaning you know, the that's the uh, the robes that you would wear to become the emperor. Yeah. So he's like, I want to buy that. So he purchased the throne from the Praetorian Guard. This sets an awful precedent that um, literally extends to the rest of the empire, where the Praetorian Guard was uh, deposing emperors. People were constantly fighting for it, but it what it did was it it set the precedent that there is no real true lineage n- anymore with the uh, the throne. There's anybody can really come and take it. If you have an army, you have guards, you know the right people, you can bribe the right people. It kind of tore that down for very powerful people, that facade for very powerful people. So that's the second thing. You got the people and the bread and circuses. You can't walk that back. You got the Praetorian Guard who are very pricey because they are charged with protecting your life. You can't walk that back. And now third. So once we get into the crisis of the third century, civil war is endemic of the empire. It is constantly. I think if you look at it, there was like 20 something emperors in a span of 75 years. There's like one year where there's like six emperors. There's another year. There's four emperors. Absolute anarchy. I mean, there was one year that the empire got carved up into three different pieces. Um, There was like, Gaul, Gaul and Britannia that had broken off. There was uh, the Near East had broken off. <laughs> just, just anarchy. And in order to maintain your claim to the throne, you had to field a massive, massive army to go defeat your rivals. So not only were you not defeating or expanding the glory of you know the Roman frontier or defeating barbarians, you were just fighting other Romans. You're fighting Mm -hmm. other emperors or so-called emperors or very wealthy individuals who wanted to claim the throne. Again, once you start that, you can't really stop it because somebody's always going to try and pull an army out of nowhere with money or mercenary force or they'll pay barbarians even, and they're going to try and uh, lay claim to the throne. So you had to be extremely wealthy. You had to... um, you, know, you had to pay the army, you had to pay the Praetorian Guard, and you had to pay the people. This gets extremely mm. expensive. Yeah. So that's one aspect of just ex- the expense of Rome surviving in the upper echelons of Roman society and the emperors, the so-called rulers of Rome, had to spend in order to survive. So looking back at the Roman Empire and the Roman economy, 
was heavily dependent on slaves. Slaves were a mm. massive part of the empire. Slaves and foreign conquest. So yeah. how do you get slaves? Well, you go and you conquer a people, you bring back some of them, and they're yours now. And they're slaves. And they would buy, be bought, sold. They were labor. They were cheap labor. They were used. Not only that, but there was also the element of actually conquering another tribe and taking all their treasure and bringing it back to Rome, filling their coffers. So that was a huge part of the economy. And after Emperor Hadrian, when Hadrian came to power, one of the things he looked around and said was, we need to consolidate Rome at this point. And at the mm -hmm. time, it was the right decision. There was really nowhere for, for Rome to expand. I mean, they had already gone across the Rhine a few times, and that ended in disaster in the Teutonberg Forest. They couldn't really push much further out into Mesopotamia because they got so far away from the heart of Rome, and they were in a totally new environment fighting the uh, Sassanids. There was no real further to go further in Africa because then you had the Sahara Desert and you had Egypt and there was Ethiopia. But again, that's you're getting you're almost overstretching. So Hadrian decides we're going to consolidate Rome. And so you've heard like Hadrian's Wall in Great Britain that he put the wall up to keep the keep the Picts and the Scots and the Caledonians who are all that's Scotland basically the the descendants of the Celts that were still alive keep them out of the empire. He fortified the Rhine and the Danube and stationed legions there permanently to keep out um, any incursions from barbarians. But really at this point, other than Marcus Aurelius um, expanding um, and fighting the Marcomanni tribes, like in southern Germany, there's really not any expansion at this point. And Rome, for all intents and purposes, has reached its greatest extent. And what I'm referring to, if you remember the first battle in Gladiator, I think that's what they're supposed to be um, I think that's what they're supposed to be like emulating and he's fighting the Germans. Hmm. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. By the way, that movie gets it so wrong. It's like Russell Crowe's awesome, but man, it was just, it's still a great movie. It, it is, but it's just so abysmally like Marcus Aurelius. Is, he, he was co he was co emperor with Commodus. Like there was no, yeah, I'm going to turn it back into a Republic. He was like, no, I'm going to rule with my son. So he knows what he's doing when I die. Yeah. <laughs> Massive plot holes. So if you've ever read a history book, you know it's – anyway. But Commodus was crazy. He was – you know, the only critique I have on Joaquin Phoenix's portrayal of him, they made him kind of cowardly, and mm. he was more st sadistic than I think he was cowardly. Um, mm. He was insane. Don't get me wrong. He was absolutely yeah. insane, but he was more sadistic. Um and like the thing is, he, you know, they kind of made him want like artsy and he, he had other virtues or whatever. He act like his, his nickname, like Commodus means boots because he would march around with the army when he was a little kid. So like he boots, actually, huh? yeah, boots, boots. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he, he had some military skill and virtue and training and all that. So, you know, not exactly fair to say. Anyway, I digress. The empire had, all, for all intents and purposes, consolidated. So that meant the influx of slave labor had shrunk dramatically. Not only that, but now they couldn't go and do an, uh, execute a foreign raid and bring back a bunch of treasure. It's not like they had a new new land or new province to conquer to bring in new tax revenue. Because that's also new tax revenue because those are now new Romans that we can tax and we can levy conscripts and we can... Uh, bring in new revenue. They just, that didn't happen anymore. So even though Rome grew maybe in population, the population that was growing was population that needed to be subsidized. So it was kind of a catch 22 with this consolidation. So, you know, that was one of the things that a lot of people kind of overlook because that happened in like 120, 122 AD and the Roman empire didn't collapse for another 350 years. Um, so with those two things taken together, it's interesting when I was doing the research for this episode, um, like I kind of compare like the Roman economy is this like proto mercantile slash capitalist society. And, and here's how hmm. I, here's how I can expand on that. Like they tried to keep all of the wealth, like they would go conquer someplace and take resources and keep it within Rome. There's, there's foreign trade. Don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. like, they would conquer a place and bring in those resources and kind of self-contain it within Rome. 
but at the same time, um, Romans believed for a long time, like they had a banking system, they had a financial system. They believed that capital should be available. So they would do, they would have loans. Like there were banks that were set up by the central government for the very purpose of acting as depositors, tracking finances, issuing credits and loans and things like that. Hmm. Um, So they had that and they believed in it. And it's interesting because they also would issue loans and the banks would not be required to have, um, you know, all of that deposit available like as a reserve. So, you know, that got, there was actually a bank run in 33 AD under uh, Emperor Tiberius and it caused a financial crisis because um, there's a run on the banks basically where people couldn't get cash and they were calling in loans and they were selling their real estate and then people were buying real estate. So it, it became a huge mess. But my point is they had, they didn't have Adam Smith's wealth of nations. They didn't have Milton Friedman. They didn't have, um, Keynes. They didn't have any of these folks, but they had this kind of proto banking system where they would issue credits. Um, but the problem was they didn't truly understand monetary policy. So mm. the Roman denarii was made of silver. And I think at its peak, it was around like 95% silver. So very, very pure, but it was mm. worth like the denarii was worth what it was made of. So like anytime you have, like you think back to when we talked about the gold standard and the dollar being tied to the gold standard, like you, your money supply in the economy is tied to this, how much silver you have or how much Mm -hmm. gold in our case you have. Well, as I mentioned in the beginning, these Roman emperors were having to spend inordinate amounts of money just to maintain their power. So what do we do? We don't have enough money. There's not enough money supply. Well, let's increase the money supply. Well, we don't have enough silver. Let's, and this is where the debasing of the currency really begins, where Mm. they start mixing in bronze. um, And so the currency value starts to drop. I think I read somewhere it was like within the third century, there was like 15,000% inflation. Um, where they go from 95% to 0.5% silver, where it's basically just bronze with like a silver paint over it. It got, I mean, it became a a true crisis, but the money became worthless. And the Romans didn't really understand like, hey, um, if you debase the value of this, if you keep debasing this, um, it's not worth anything. And it got so bad that during the crisis of the third century, um, like the banks basically disappeared. So like the banking system, it kind of evaporated. So it, it rose to prominence in the first century AD. And then like- Why, like, why did they disappear? Well, um, <laughs> interesting question. So they disappeared partly be, from external pressures. Like um, you think about how many civil wars there were happening, how many barbarian invasions and how many fights were occurring. Like Roman emperors would take control of the mint Um I think it was Diocletian tried to move all of the mints and who was making these, uh, producing these coins closer to Rome so he could keep an eye on them because um, the debasing of the currency was not always official policy. It was kind of unofficial policy and they would often pocket Mm. a lot of the change. So there was Mm -hmm. a lot of corruption occurring. Um, People, and then people lost confidence in the banking system as well. So um, not only do you have these civil wars, so it's like, where do I keep my money? If it, if they don't have it, where is it? So why would I put my, it kind of the same thing in the depression. It's like, why would I put my money in the bank? So they, they start yeah. to just disappear and they fall out of the record sometime in the late third century. Um, but it, it's, it's eerily similar. It's like, well, people lose faith in this currency that's losing its value very quickly because we're funding all of these conflicts and we've got all of these programs. We, Oh, wow. Kind of weird. It sounds very familiar. Government spending going, exacerbating the problem. And in the third century, like prices got so bad. And so this is more of the Romans not really understanding monetary policy. So the, the value of the coins is going down. Uh, inflation is spiking by thousands of percents. It's going up. Well, the Romans are like, well, shoot, we still got to fund all of these armies because we can't just not pay the legions on the, on the Rhine. We can't yeah. just pay the Danube Legion, not pay them. They'll mar- they'll either A, march on Rome or they'll stop, and then we'll have a barbarian horde coming through over the border. So they would raise taxes, and they kept raising taxes higher and higher, mm. and it became such a massive burden. I mean, there were um, 
you know, and uh, inflation is already a tax on the middle class. So there were poor families that would literally have to either sell themselves or their family members into slavery to pay their debts. And they could, they just couldn't do it or they would often. And so, um, you know, it became a real bad problem. And then Diocletian recognized this and Diocletian was an incredible emperor, probably one of the best Romans ever had. Um, if you think about it, he established, and this is a quick sidebar, he established the Tetrarchy, which is basically four emperors rule, ruling four oh, sections yeah. of the Roman Empire. And over the past like 70 something years at this point, Rome had been torn apart by all of these competing um, emperors, so to speak, so to speak, or claimants to the throne. And he was able to essentially sit on top of this tetrarchy and dominate these three other co-emperors into doing, you know, he was like the, he was the Augustus. He wasn't a Caesar. He was an Augustus. And he was like the senior Augustus above all of them. Mm, So he kind of ruled that like, that's how powerful and, you know, incredible his strength of will is. Um, And then he retired and grew cabbages on the Adriatic Sea. Um, Good for him. Yeah. And, you know, I think of the meme <laughs> of that farmer that's just like, it's a simple life. It ain't much, but it's honest work. Yeah. That, just put Diocletian's face on there. <laughs> back to what I was saying, he he saw these as a problem and his only thought was, well, I'm just going to institute price, you know, an uh, edict of prices and put price controls on things. They, the merchants cannot raise prices anymore. This is the price, you know, and Rome said it. They're like, this is the price. And it was a disaster. It didn't work. Merchants either yeah. flat out ignored it. Or price they would controls just, never work. Yeah, they never work. And that just goes to show that the Romans were very, very adept at military strategy, architecture, engineering. Incredible. Monetary policy, not so much. Not so much. It's, <laughs> it's not so much that they were bad either. I mean, they were truly handling an a multi-ethnic, multi-country, you know, you think about how big they were, they were trying to manage all of that with no technology. Like, how do you do it? You know, they knew nothing. Yeah. They were figuring it out all themselves. So, you know, you cut them some slack there, but it's interesting to see and that. when there's so much corruption, it's really hard to get an accurate, like, you know, your ledgers aren't right. You yeah. can't, your data's faulty because there's so much corruption people taking stuff off the top it's hard to get ground truth well that that's kind of the one of the other points like if if you think about the late stage rome like it, it's so big how do you manage this well we have to have provincial governors and they have this administrative staff and they're permanent and they have to exist and they have to be paid and well you know it, it's very hard to track money because, you know, there's mm. no digital currency or anything like that. So, yes, there was levels of corruption and it was almost kind of like the cost of, you know, you hear the term cost of doing business, but there was levels of corruption. So by the time it filters to the emperor and there's so many other problems, it's like, what do I go do? Do I go handle a couple corrupt governors in Gaul and Italy or do, do I go meet these barbarians and then I have to, as soon, as soon as I defeat them, I got to march my army back over to Asia Minor to, you know, defeat this person who's laying claim to the throne. What do you do? You're, you're yeah. most likely going to be one man and one army. Um, so there's only so much you could do. And so money just kept as much money as there was. It just got bled out and siphoned out of the economy and kind of filtered out. And so all of these programs just not, I keep saying programs like that's such a modern, such a modern thing to say like, Oh, well we have these government programs these 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 uh necessities these functions of the roman empire these necessities like roads protection cities grain all of that is not able to be supported so that's kind of the picture you get from the crisis of the third century so it's like well what is going to happen now the empire is split up into these tetrarchies, um, these four different sections. There's east, west, and there's kind of like a north, south. If you want to look at it on a map, and Constantine comes and reunites the empire um, under one. But the empire now is less safe from external threats. So if you think about it, kind of like he Constantine was the last one. Or, you know, between Diocletian, really Aurelian before Diocletian, all the way through Constantine, you you had kind of a semi-peace, like Constantine had to fight uh, internally 
Uh, Aurelian did, you know, so there's still some internal conflict, but by and large, it wasn't as chaotic as it was um, during the previous 70 odd years. But the external threats that the Roman Empire was facing was dramatically increased. So what they started having to do was, well, we know barbarians are going to pour through. So we're just going to start fortifying cities. And Mm. if you live on the frontier, um, hey, good luck. We're going to fortify it, but we're not going to patrol this massive border that we have. We have some walls. We have some basic protections. We have garrisons. But uh, we're actually going to train you kind of as like a local levy. And then you guys can fortify your own little city. So that gives rise to these kind of little fiefdoms um, and sets the stage for feudalism, believe it or not. So hmm. like if you are a Roman Empire peasant living in, in Gaul in, let's say, 390 AD, you've got the Franks, you've got other Germanic tribes breathing down your neck. And it's not so much that there's a massive army coming to raid your village, but there's a lot of like bands and war parties that are coming through. Like, what do you do? Well, we're going to find a landowner. We can trade our services as farmers and um, soldiers, and he can protect us. He can shield us from tax burdens. He can provide us uh, basic organization and structure and we'll provide service to him. And you kind of have these little fiefdoms being carved out throughout the empire uh, in order to combat external threats uh, from Mm -hmm. barbarians and then kind of being as a little bit of a tax shield. Now that eventually evolves into feudalism because then those become lords and serfs. And that's what feudalism was. It had its roots in late antiquity of Rome. Yeah. So like at this point of the Roman empire, they, can't really afford to field truly effective armies to combat barbarians all the time. So they began paying barbarians to fight within the ranks of Rome. There was a huge, there's also a huge plague that occurred. um, The Antonine plague uh, back in the early 200s AD or mid 200 AD wiped out a ton of uh, the population of Rome. At this point, they're having poor crop yields. So the agrarian aspect of the Roman economy, which was massive, started to fail and food supplies got short. So the population, plus all these civil wars, so the population started going down pretty dramatically too. So when the population starts going down and you can't support yourself, you have to pay for foreign armies or foreign foreigners to come in and fight your battles, which they started to, and you lose tax revenue. So Taxes are going up because they have to make up for this lost revenue. The money is no longer worth anything because you keep having to debase the value of it. There's not really any external protection from external threats. So you're having to for you're forced to live in this little fiefdom kind of away from the protection of Rome. Um, and you sort of form your own little communities and the Roman empire simply becomes like too big to fail at this point. So if any, at this point it's so delicate and so fragile that if it was to lose really any province, you think about it, if you were to lose Great Britain or Britannia, you lose Britannia and just wipe that off. That is um, a huge source of tin pottery. Mm -hmm. It was a house of cards. It was a house of cards. Exactly. Anytime you remove one little thing, the whole thing comes crashing down. Well, And so, I mean, I just use Britannia as an example there. You lose Britannia, all the tax revenue there. For that whole population, you lose, that's also legions that you can call upon. You don't have that anymore. You don't have that trade, you know, that part of the trade route. If you lose North Africa and parts of, you suddenly lose the ability to feed all of the people that live on the Italian peninsula, the most populous area of the empire. You just can't feed them anymore. Uh, People that are hungry get extremely angry and they're very volatile. Plus your population is going to continue to go down. So it sort of becomes this doom spiral and where um, I think it was in 410, actually Honorius looked around and was like, man, we got a ton of problems. Uh, Hey, take up, take up arms as good Roman citizens. Um, We can't protect you. And Rome pulled out of great Britain and uh, in 410, not too long after that, the vandals came sacked Rome and made their way through Spain all the way to North Africa and North Africa eventually broke off a few years later. So, Suddenly now the Western Roman Empire doesn't have Britannia, doesn't have North Africa, can't feed it, losing its population, can't feed the remaining population. And where are they going to get the money now to defend themselves? So yeah, it's this house of cards that suddenly starts falling apart. 
<clears throat> we can't afford to pay standing armies. We can't afford to keep the barbarians paid and keep them from turning themselves on Rome at this point. So it becomes this, yeah, you know, like you said, a house of cards, a doom spiral where we we were too big to fail and one little thing started happening and it was almost like um it's like a domino effect really you push the tiny little domino and it kind of spreads out and suddenly every domino across like this huge atrium or gymnasium just starts falling down yeah yeah it's i feel like a characteristic of bad policy and bad governance is establishing this system to where there are there's no redundancy Mm. like you are there's no depth to your policy that if any one thing fails it all comes crashing down like you said this house of cards i feel like now we've kind of seen like you know not to not to take you off track here for rome but like the you know, we're in the midst of all this craziness with the the House of Representatives right now. And, you know, we've kind of seen this negotiating game going back and forth for the speaker. And then all of a sudden, this unexpected event, right? The mm-hmm. Hamas does the surprise attack. And we can't do anything federally um, because we're still in this bickering match within Congress. Like, there's no depth, right? Like, there's no... There's no redundancy. There's no like, okay, if this one mechanism fails, we've got some other things that can catch up. It's just kind of like we're flying by the seat of our pants, hoping that nothing ever goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And we've built the system to be resilient only if everything's perfect. And that's a sign of, I think, poor governance. Yeah, I... I think the culture episode is going to start exposing kind of the why they didn't feel that some of these redundancies were necessary. But I think a lot of – because the decline took so long, I think that a lot of people who live – if you were to ask a Roman in – during Constantine or when Diocletian reigned, if you were to ask them like, hey, is Rome going to collapse? They would say, no way. No, yeah. not a chance because we have this, 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 and this, and all of these different things. And at the time they did, but they didn't really grasp like, well, what if a few of these things were pulled away? What if there was a plague? What if there was another plague? What if the, what if the barbarian armies that we're facing are no longer in the tens of thousands, but in the hundreds of thousands? What if that's mm-hmm. how big they are? What if um, we keep fighting these civil wars and we just decimate our fighting age population. They, there's just things that occur generationally over and over decades that they just couldn't factor in. And they were a lot of times arrogant to it and didn't want to hear yeah. it probably and just didn't believe that it could happen. But it's it's goes back to what I, we said in the beginning. When an empire falls, it doesn't fall just suddenly out of nowhere, unexpectedly. The unexpected army shows up you know, unopposed and sweeps down. It's not how it happens. It's gradually over time and then suddenly all at once it happens and it kind of unravels that's what happens yeah um so i i think that's what we need to take into account with you know kind of your example of yeah that was that was a a small bit of uh lack of redundancy but how do we do that for and you know the united states how do we establish that how do we because if you think back to like the depression or the great recession that most of us have lived through those happened and they thought that the checks and balances that they had in place would prevent it but reality they didn't they probably didn't even slow it down you know as you're especially as you're talking about debasing the currency um we're obviously in an a inflationary um environment right now it's Mm -hmm. not as bad as it was last year right like inflation's kind of gone back down for the most part um but nevertheless like i'm i feel like if you would if you could survey the average american and just kind of like hey how much confidence do you have in the u.s dollar right now um it would, it would probably be pretty low 
even though um, the relative strength of the dollar to other global currencies has be- has increased in strength quite a bit mm-hmm. over since 2020, since COVID got started. Um, but we printed like, uh, what was it? Five trillion dollars uh, over the course of from like 2020 to 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 present. Like, yeah, like three a quarter, trillion. A quarter of our twenty five percent of our um, money supply was printed, like in that one year. Yeah, it's it's kind of one of those things that's like like you're talking about the bread and games. Like once you get started, or or the debase in the currency. Like you know when somebody's like, oh. It used to be ninety five percent silver. We're going to make it ninety percent silver. That's not a big deal. Exactly. Two years later, oh, it's going to be ninety percent silver and ten percent copper. Like, not a big deal. It gets to you the know, point you do where that for fifty years. It's nothing. It's not even fifty years. I mean, it's a hundred years where you had people would be alive and they wouldn't remember a time that the silver was ninety five percent. It would be yeah. It, it was fifty percent. Well, it just went from fifty to forty, and it seems and, normal. It, and it, it's not like it was, and that's another thing. It's not like they were conscious policies of like, hey, debase it 5% more. It was kind of like, hey, you need to take a little bit more out. Oh, okay, got it. And so all these mints operated independently of one another. So, yeah, you know, it's kind of this unequal thing that you couldn't quite tell. Yeah, I feel like, you know, just kind of listening to you talk one of the lessons learned that I'm getting from the economics of Rome is things can get out of control quickly, but it takes forever, not forever. It takes a hundred plus years for you to really feel the effects of how things are out of control. And be, like, it's almost like, um, uh, it's like pushing a ball the size of the sun, right? Like it takes a it takes a lot of actions to get it started, but once it's started, it is not stopping, and it's gonna and it's gonna be slow. But you've already messed up. Um, I like that's the that's the kind of thing is you really do have to think about like, Hey, it might seem like a really small and insignificant decision today, but we are pushing the sun in a direction that it, that we should not push it in. And we are going to get burned (laughs) in a very practical sense. Think about it like this. Um, all of when it, we say population decline, it's kind of like, well, it, we think of like birth rate or whatever. Let's, let's just use that for example. If the birth rate decreases by, you know, it's cut in half because there's a famine and, you know, the <clears throat> the death rate spikes like during the Antonine Plague and then the subsequent civil wars and, you know, the food shortages and all that. Not only it's not just people dying, it's people not being born. So you are mm-hmm. suddenly losing like two people, not only just to replace the people that had them, but two more who are going to be your tax base, who are going to be, go fight your battles, who are going to have more kids for you to. And so suddenly within three generations, you look around the city of Rome and you're like, it's empty here where yeah. there used to be a million people here. And suddenly you're like, where are Rome's armies to defend us? And you're like, there's nobody left to fight. We don't really want to fight. And even if we did, there's not enough people to field a true army when Attila's got 400,000, you know, uh, Huns, Goths, and whoever else fighting on his side. We, the, the people just aren't there. So it's, well, we're just going to debase the currency a little bit. Well, we're just not going to rotate the crop fields well, we're just going to stretch it a little bit further. Suddenly those, those small decisions, like you were saying, end up being, well, suddenly the population of Rome is halved or it's down to 10% of what it once was at its peak. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where you get to a point of no return where it's just like, well, at this point we're on life support and short of a, a miracle or literally pulling everybody into circle Rome and then restart at that point, like a hard reboot, but you're just not going to, you're not going to recover. And they didn't. Yeah. And it's Death interesting. A thousand cuts. De- yeah. Um, 
it's interesting. I also kind of want to dispel this myth <clears throat> um, with the Dark Ages. <sighs> when Rome, when the Western Roman Empire fell, um, you got to think it fell historically speaking, like the last 70 years, it fell and there was truly no replacement. And like I said, there's, you had specialization. You had the ability where artisans and craftsmen and intellectuals and academics could thrive all over the empire. People kind of look at the dark ages and they either blame Christianity or they they blame kind of like a, a backwards culture. And I, I kind of want to say it's not so much that they were backwards so much as they had to revert to true survival. Like they didn't have this luxury of sitting around making pottery, reading and uh, translating other books. They had to do all of the baseline functions to survive. It was no longer, well, Rome is, we have people protecting us. We have people paying for what I'm making. I can get really good at this craft. So it's not like people just forgot for whatever reason in Great Britain in the sixth century. It's that well, they kind of forgot, It's but they forgot because they were too busy fighting off all of these invading armies, and they were trying to figure out how to survive again when suddenly the carpet got pulled out of them from Rome. And a lot of that was the economy. So it, the economy enabled um, those arts and those crafts and that all of that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, I like how you started us off with Rome had really created the first – Mediterranean transregional economy. That's a better way to put it than I did. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Colin. <laughs> uh, like that economy had significant benefits, right? Like it allowed, like you said, it allowed grain grown uh, near the Nile to be shipped all the way up to um, northern, you know, what's northern France, Gaul, and, mm-hmm. and even England. Um, and likewise, like other other products that were made elsewhere, you know, silver could be mined in Spain and shipped all over the empire. Like it was this transregional economy. And that's a good thing. And And then it becomes dependent upon one another. Mm-hmm. And then the efficiency of the whole economy – uh, begins to go down because corruption, uh, you know, like you said, the the barbarians chipping away at the frontier, and it's really it's really hard to keep such a delicate system uh, in place. I I think it's it it kind of makes me think about you know because one of the one of the hot topics in um, not just foreign policy, but economics today is the seeming fracturing of globalism, right? And how in the 90s, we were like, globalism's the future. Uh, the entire world is going to be this global economy where we're going to tear down you know, barriers, we're going to have free markets, free trade. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be great. And even just recently, you know, there's, there's so many examples of, of how that system is failing, but even recently uh, with Russia, Ukraine, we've seen, you know, Russia was the main supplier of natural gas to, to Europe. And we've seen Europe struggling Um you know, every single winter in Europe, there's people worried about how they're going to heat their homes um, and how they're, uh, which is a matter of survival in certain certain parts of Europe uh, where you can literally freeze to death. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's just kind of this, like, we've created this system that's so complicated, similar to the, Ro- the Roman market, and it's... You know, it's like building a tower really high up in the sky. Like, um, it's like, it's impressive. It, if it works, it works really well. But 
you know, if it's not secure and you just pull the right brick out from underneath it, it's like a Jenga tower and it just all comes collapsing down. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've seen that with globalism today. Like, um, you know, the economy in uh, 2020, even before COVID was starting to stagnate, um, and then COVID happened, the one plague, which frankly wasn't even that bad, uh, not to diminish, you know, people that were impacted by it, but like, we're going to talk you know, the, about some really bad plagues during this series. So don't you worry. Yeah. Like, I mean, heck was it the bubonic plague, like killed two thirds of people in some locations in Europe, like two thirds. We didn't even get remotely near that in COVID and it's had a huge impact on our economy. So. Oh, uh, um, quick sidebar to put you, thinking of a disease calling a, a fall of a civilization the Justinian plague occurred in like the 7th century AD and there is a it is a really strong uh, contender for one of the reasons that uh, the eastern empire fell Byzantine Rome um, 700 years later because the population mm-hmm. never recovered but it took 700 years after that cataclysmic event to to eventually collapse yeah. Talk about more of that later. Yeah. And I guess that's kind of like, again, going back to my depth comment, it's like, you know, we build our towers of Babel, right? Where we, as as a human civilization, say, look what we've done. We have, uh, you know, we're so impressive. I mean, and, and this has never been more true than the United States of America, right? Like, we are the most affluent, luxurious civilization that's ever existed in the face of the planet. Uh, And yet it feels like it's a house of cards sometimes. Um, I'm not wishing that, of course. Uh, You know, I I love America. (laughs) I I would love for us to be around for a thousand years uh, or what have you. But, um, you know, there just seems to be like this certain element of ego and pride where mm-hmm. just like the Romans, where we've created this economy and yet it doesn't take much, you know, it, and it takes surprising things coming from out of nowhere that you didn't expect uh, to just make it all come crashing down. And, and the only thing that I can think of, if we, if we want to be sustainable, if we actually want to be enduring and resilient, uh, you know, I keep going back to the, um, uh, you know, we got to have depth, uh, depth in policy, depth in, in institutions, right? Like um, we, we need to have uh, an economy that doesn't have these like single points of failure in it uh, mm-hmm. to where, uh, it, I mean, honestly, you know, you look at the debt uh, here in the United States, like it's one of those things that's like, oh, it's not a concern right now, right? Like I know, th- was it 30 some odd trillions of dollar trillion dollars of debt sounds like a lot and it is a lot. But we are definitely not over leveraged. Our GDP is absolutely ginormous. Um, but kind of similar to debasing the currency, it's like we're at like 50% silver, 50% 10, right? Like who's to say 50 well, it, years from now we're a hundred trillion dollars of debt and it's too late, you know? <laughs> it, it, I think that's the best way to put it. Like at what point? That's an interesting thought exercise. Like, at what point would it have been like, hey, Rome can turn the economy around? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, dude, is yes. there, is there, is was there, a, there spot? a point in which they could have fixed it? I don't know. Based on their economic model, where they required basically constant conquest in imported slave labor, it was probably around Hadrian. They they really just needed to keep expand that that's the only way. And you know, obviously that's kind of impossible unless they were to at that point of consolidation, like rework their markets and their economy altogether, which at the time had never even been thought of. These some of these things had never been conceived. Like they would have had to continue conquest. Yeah. Only way. 
I, I think. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, but even then, like, say they would have had, if they would have had some successful campaigns against the Germans, right? Mm-hmm. Um, then what? Like, was their their institutions were so, were still set up on uh, foundations of sand, right? Like, okay, you conquer parts of Germany. Um, but you still have the corruption. You still have people that are trying to make a denarii. Uh, and I don't know, like, I don't know if expansion would have fixed it as much as, um, it was kind of, You know, it's kind of funny. Rome lasted for so long, but yeah, in a in another sense, like it was, it was like um, um, like a sparkler on the Fourth of July. <laughs> Historically speaking, like it's finite. Yeah. It burns bright and then it's gone, right? And it has to go. Like there is no continuing to add, like. By definition, you can't add stuff to the sparkler, right? You can only transfer it to a different sparkler. Uh, sorry, that may have been one of the more lame analogies that I've used here on this podcast. Oh, I feel but. like it's offensive to call it sparkler, but, <laughs> but it, even still, there's a finite amount of resources that they could burn. There's a finite distance that they could go to conquer. And that's kind of why I bring the point, like, well, do they expand to something that they fundamentally weren't? Like, do they create a new economy? Do they think that up or something? Is that even possible? Mm. You know, well, you know, you probably could make the argument that they did try to fundamentally change who they were, like what you said with the Tetrarchy. Like, you know, Rome forever was ruled from Rome. Mm. Uh, and then all of a sudden it was like, boom. And we got four like, emperors now. <laughs> we're going to try. Was it the Tetrarchy or the Triumvirate that came first? The, the the Triumvirate. Remember, there's the first Triumvirate and that had Caesar and Pompey. The second one had um, Octavian and Mark Antony. So, um, the, so the there tetrarchy. had been previous instances of like trial runs of having multiple kind of emperors. You, you got to think. Well, the first triumvirate was there was technically not an emperor, so Julius Caesar mm. never technically became the. You know, it was not imperial Rome. He was assassinated before that happened. But there had been powerful alliances similar to the tetrarchy, but the tetrarchy was. Like, think of it as an official policy. Like, this is the way we are going to rule because we are so massive. One man can't do it. Mm, yeah, there's there's just so much to think about in why did Rome fall. And I think, honestly, Colin, I think we like barely scratched the surface in this episode of what were the economic factors that caused Rome to fall I think you did a really good job talking about, um, you know, how Rome had created this first, uh, med- you know, trans Mediterranean economy that uh, was very much a house of cards, and that when when certain pieces began being pulled, uh, other things started to struggle. You know, you talked about debasing the currency. Um, what else? I'm forgetting some stuff. Debasing the currency, raising tax rates. Uh, oh yeah, the bread and games. Crazy amounts of expenditures. Um, Praetorian decline. guard. Yeah, Praetorian guard armies, bread and games, buying. Um, you know, a declining population from poor harvests and a, a fractured empire. So yeah, mm. it's. Oh, and a lack of conquest, which means less, fewer slaves. Yeah. Which means fewer labor which yep. means less goods and services. <laughs> exactly. um, yeah, it was just kind of like, you know, so, it, you know, there was so much stuff to cover that um, I'm, I'm really looking forward, Colin, to hearing you talk about uh, the military, uh, like the defense and the cultural aspects to the fall of Rome. Because um, I... I just think that there's so many lessons that we here in the United States and in the West uh, can learn 
about um because it's like you like you say a hundred times right it doesn't history doesn't repeat but it rhymes so here we are um and to our listeners i hope y'all learned something as well uh i really enjoyed listening to colin and and getting to interact with him on on this episode in our in our first episode on the fall of empires uh if you did enjoy this episode and you did learn something uh please uh support this podcast the best way you can do so is by leaving us a five-star review on whatever uh device that you're or or uh, system that you're listening to us on um just go down there click that five-star review that uh that helps the algorithm get the word out and recommend our podcast to other people uh you can also subscribe uh uh, depending on how you're listening uh, to us, there's there's a subscribe button, um, and that way you can keep up to date and know when our next episode is is going to be released. Um, and uh, the last thing we ask uh, is if you do leave us a five star review, leave us a comment, uh, tell us what you like, tell us what you didn't like, tell us how you think we can improve. We are under no uh, no impression that we've got this all figured out. So tell us how we can approve. And if you leave us a five-star uh, review, we'll give you a shout out on our next episode. And uh, we really look forward to uh, having y'all join us next week uh, for episode two on the fall of Rome and our fall of empire series. So until then have a great week. Mm-hmm.